All right, one second already. Got to get the Chiron. Got to get the Chiron updated here. Boom. All right, and <clears throat> there we go. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. Hold on. Doink. All right, hey everybody, welcome to Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing, episode 405. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Ozier, and over the next 45 minutes, got to get the audio levels right. Over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Aishu, uh, Shuttle Crab, Harvey Jackson over on LinkedIn, Jeff Hodgkin, Tim and George, all the Simply Cyber community mods, maybe... Maybe uh, some Jim McQu uh, <laughs> James McQuiggan and you, the Simply Cyber community squad members. We're going to be ripping through the top cybersecurity news stories of the day, and I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. So how can you operationalize what we're talking about today at work or this week or this quarter, uh, more of a strategic play? Or if you're looking to break in the industry, which I know some of you are, Trust me, guys, there's no easy button to break into the industry, but one of the things that's going to do you a huge benefit is staying informed on what's going on in our industry, and the Daily Cyber Threat Brief podcast is one heck of a way to do that. You will be asked in any job interview, I guarantee you, and people in chat who have been in interviews lately can attest to this. You will be asked, how do you stay current? This is a phenomenal answer. What's up, Kimberly? Kimberly's team hybrid, everybody. Kimberly's team hybrid, <laughs> secrets out. So grab your coffee, grab your tea, grab your beverage of choice. If it's a smoothie, maybe you just did a little workout, whatever it is, settle in. We got a great show for you today, but before we get into it, I do want to say shout out and thanks to the stream sponsors who allow me to be able to get up here every single morning at 8 a.m. Eastern time and deliver the daily threat briefing podcast, starting with my good friends, Black Hills Information Security, Jason Blanchard, his entire team over there under John Strand's leadership have forged anti-siphon training, which is an amazing uh, business that delivers a variety of excellent uh, cybersecurity related trainings, both offensive and defensive, um, you know, entry level trainings all the way up to more advanced uh, seasoned practitioner specific skills training. It's an entire yard sale of um, eclectic trainings to, uh, worth checking out. And I want to point out that when John Strands, Mono Julian, my man. All right, Mono Julian, good morning. Sorry, missed yesterday. Had to handle a bunch of onboarding end users. Seen the replay. Shout out to the connections. No problem, Mono Julian. Great to have you in chat. Guys, um, I just want to remind you too, when John Strand offers up his um, pay what you can courses on the anti-siphon platform I will be highlighting that to you in chat I've taken some of them myself I would not allow a company to be a sponsor I would not put them in front of you uh, unless I believed in them myself and anti-siphon is just phenomenal if you yourself are in chat and have taken anti-siphon training please let us know in chat what your results were what your experience was I'm going to drop a little there's a reason John Strand has an emote in the Simply Cyber Squad emote deck. Also want to say shout out and thanks to uh, Panopsi. Poor Panopsi, their website. I can't, I try my best, guys, to like put the picture on the screen, but it's so hard. I, I did a, actually did a screenshot for, uh, <laughs> for them. See if I can find it. I can't find it. All right. Oh, here it is. Let's see if I can clean this up a bit. Doink. All right, how's that, guys? A little bit better? Listen, Panopsi Security, run by Brandon Poole. Uh, small, um, smaller company out of South Carolina, but serving international customer bases. Don't think you're too small or too large for a quantified risk assessment. A quantified risk assessment but by Panopsi Security is going to look at your people, process, and technology and actually give you a statistically sound output that will allow you to make informed decisions. Now, if you're like looking to break in or you're a practitioner who's like hands on keyboard and you're like, Jerry, that sounds like CISO stuff. I don't care. Yes, but let me let me offer you this piece of information. James McQuiggan, my man. Hey, cheers, buddy. Cheers, James. 
Here's the deal. Even if you're a GRC analyst one and you're looking up two tiers to the CISO, if the CISO doesn't look like the CISO has a plan, okay? If you seem much more reactionary than proactive, okay? A quantified risk assessment can help. You don't walk into the CISO's office and be like, excuse me, ma'am, you don't know how to do your job. Here's a quantified risk assessment. What I would suggest is say, hey, I don't know what our, um, what our three-year roadmap looks like, but I heard about Panopsi Security's quantified risk assessment and it looks really interesting. Maybe we check it out, right? You can, uh, you can get more flies with honey than vinegar if you're picking up what I'm putting down. All right. And then also, obviously, guys, uh, shout out and love to Barricade Cyber Solutions, but uh, more about them at the mid-roll. If you are live with us right now, 168 of you beautiful people, 170 of you beautiful people, James McQuiggan getting the coffee flowing. Hashtag team live in chat if you're live with us right now. Hashtag team hybrid if you got here late, Kimberly, or if you are have to leave early because you got a meeting or something, let us know in chat, team hybrid. My team replay people, I've got a special uh, faction for you. I think if we were on an island and it was team live and team replay, I, I feel like I would, my, my, my heart would be, or my head would be team live and my heart would be team replay. I love you team replay. <laughs> So, and then obviously my new favorites, if it's your first time here, I have been going gangbusters. Doris Scheut Neuss is in chat. Doris, coming out of Germany. Doris, it's been a minute. Haven't seen you in chat in a bit. Hope everything's well. Guys, I've been busting my hump in order to try to get more um, exposure for the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Brief. Um, really, like I've been, you know, with the LinkedIn social media posts, I go on different podcasts and talk about the morning brief and I'm trying to grow our community people. Uh, so it seems to be working, but if you're a first timer here, do me a favor in chat, just type hashtag first timer. We do love welcoming our first timers and letting them know uh, what to expect here and know that it's a great supportive, inclusive community uh, for everybody to be welcomed. And then my favorite, favorite hashtag passive observer. If you're shy, you don't know how to socially network, just drop hashtag passive observer in chat. Let us welcome you. Each episode's worth a half a CPE, so be sure to get those CPEs. Sit back, relax, and let's let the cool sounds of the hot news wash over us so in an awesome wave. See you guys at the mid-roll. It's Tuesday, July 11th, 2023. Jump Cloud resets customer API keys. The access management company informed customers that it took the action in response to an ongoing incident. No word on any specifics, but JumpCloud said it came out of an abundance of caution. The company's website claims it provides technology to over 180,000 organizations. However, given the potential service disruptions resetting API keys could cause, it speaks to the seriousness of the incident. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to say what's up to uh, Jordan Ritter coming out of Italy. Jordan, I know Italy's a huge country, but if you see Tom Bishop, give him a high five. He just moved there. Show him where the good cafes are and how to get a great espresso. All right, guys. I've never heard of Jump Cloud. Maybe you have in chat. I don't know. But here's the thing. Jump Cloud is obviously a software as a service provider. Um, that's why they're using API keys. Remember, API keys are application programming interface keys. What does that mean, Jerry? I don't know what API means. All it means is when you access a, and this is like, like, okay, so really quickly, two things. One, I forgot to mention this. One, I do not see these stories or do any prep work before the show starts. So this is my initial reaction. Secondly, I'm very mindful of people who are trying to break in the industry or more junior, okay? So sometimes I break things down that may be obvious to you, but just bear with me. We're here to uh, b better ourselves and, and share knowledge. API keys, okay, really quickly, every SaaS provider should offer API keys, right? Here's the deal. When you log into uh, Google.com, right, or, and you type in something in the search bar, that's you using a web application front end. But when you type in Simply Cyber into Google and hit return, the web app that Google wrote is basically making an API call to the Google search engine back end. Well, if you... Uh, Jordan or Rachel Chinyoka get an API key, you don't have to go through the web application front end. You can write a little Python code that does it for you, right? And then, but how do you authenticate? How do you, how do they know 
excuse me, if someone's abusing it, if they charge for API queries, how do they know how to bill? They generate unique API keys that both A, authenticate who you are, B, verify that you're authorized to access it, and C, attribute it in a way that they can, you know, bill, invoice, pull audit logs, find out if you've been searching some weird funky stuff, whatever it is, okay? But API keys, that's what it is at its basis, okay? So for JumpCloud or any SaaS provider for that matter, to um, basically force all API keys to expire, that's a pretty massive issue, okay? Here, here's how the decision went down, okay? This is like, listen, this is, this is like, you put the tinfoil hat on, but this is basically what happened, just to kind of emphasize the seriousness of this story. Somebody said, hey, we have a massive issue with a compromised API key. Uh, obviously, they, they, don't, they couldn't tell, uh, it, it must have been something with the way the API keys were generated or something, because it wasn't a single API key. It was many or all API keys due to an ongoing incident. How do we stop it? The CEO says, well, we could reset all customer API keys. That would fix the problem. Okay, what's the impact of that? We will piss off every single customer we have. Now, remember, SaaS companies are all about straight cash, homie. Thank you, Randy. They're all about straight cash, homie, right? So imagine, if you will, that you have, um, imagine like Netflix or whatever. Imagine if every single Netflix customer had to re log in, right? You would have a faction of them that would be super pissed. Now, Jump Cloud, when they reset the API key, not only are you disrupting all customers, but any customer that has developed some type of software solution that depends on Jump Cloud, but is actually baked into their product. You follow me here? So Jump Cloud is a backend solution that's integrated into another product, and then that product is being sold to other customers. So now not only are you pissing off Jump Cloud's customers, but any customer that's using Jump Cloud as part of a solution and selling it downstream to their customers, you're pissing off all their customers too. This is not a light decision to make, resetting all API keys. I'm, I, like The whole reason I explained all of this is to really emphasize the weight of this decision. You do not make this decision flippantly. And if they did, oh boy, someone's butt is going to get burnt, right? If some director of IT was like, oh, just reset all the API keys and let's go get tacos, problem solved. This thing's going to bubble up. When, when they look at the uh, month-end numbers for July and they see a bunch of people, they call it churn, when they see a bunch of people quit using Jump Cloud. Uh, so just be mindful of that. Anyways, this is essentially a nuclear option, by the way. This is like a nuclear option uh, to solve a problem. It definitely, res it, well, I would assume it, it, it sorted out the problem, um, but it's not good. Nice, Andres Escobar passing the sec plus. My man, Andres. Wow. Love it. All right, let's keep rolling. I said, let's keep rolling. Would you be interested in a slightly used dark web market? I would. Operators of accounts tied to the fraud platform Genesis Market began advertising about a sale of the platform in forum posts. These posts initially appeared on June 28th. On the one hand, Genesis provides genuine innovation in cybercrime, not just offering a platform to sell stolen data, but also offering a browser extension to impersonate victims, letting you weaponize it more easily. On the other hand, it's a tough sell, given that the FBI led an operation to seize its Claire Web domains three months ago. It's also on the U.S. Treasury sanctions list. The U.K.'s National Crime Agency says Genesis Dark Web mirrors remain hosted in an inaccessible jurisdiction. Okay, so here's a couple things. Um, one, <laughs> I mean, it's like trying to sell your a house that's been um, um, taken over by the bank or selling a car that has been repossessed, <laughs> right? That's what's going on. And I know you can't really see this because of the my the way I'm zoomed in on this thing. But anyways, Genesis Market. Guys, if you were on stream yesterday, okay? If you were on stream yesterday, I spent a couple minutes going down the rabbit hole of uh, Ross Ulbricht, dark web marketplaces, um, you know, um, internal access brokers, 
or insider access brokers. Like these dark web marketplaces, if you're selling something on the dark web and you get taken down, another one's gonna crop up. There's too much money. The risk is, too, is low compared to the amount of money you can make and the chances of getting ca uh, caught. So Genesis Marketplace was a bigger one and the FBI seized them and they're trying to sell it. Guys, basically, you know, it, can't, it took me a while to kind of wrap my head around this, but you've got to remember, even though they're criminal enterprises, whether they're ransomware threat actors, maybe their stealer is a ransomware services, I'm not through with that, or they're dark web marketplaces, it is a business. It's an illicit business. I'm sure they don't pay taxes and it's definitely um, not legal, but they have products, they have customers, they have customer support, they have infrastructure, they probably have metrics meetings, right? It's just a business. So this Genesis Marketplace, when the FBI seized them, they stopped making money. Again, Great cash, homie. dude, I don't care if you're um, Jump Cloud resetting everybody's API key or your Genesis Marketplace getting seized by the FBI. At the end of the day, when you boil it down, the business is no longer making money, and that's a problem for the business owners. So what they're trying to do in this instance is sell the marketplace. And essentially, what I would assume they're trying to sell is three things. One, the brand which probably has zero value now because obviously the FBI is wicked into it. Two is the, the infrastructure of providing a marketplace, right? There's no WordPress plugin or WordPress template for dark web marketplace, okay? I mean, you could probably appropriate a marketplace template, but for the most part, you'd be buying a turnkey, quote unquote, uh, marketplace solution. And then three, um, you know, the, the notoriety of, of it and the ability to, um, you know, already, already know kind of like the workflows of how to deliver on product and stuff like that. Here's the thing. This thing is radioactive. No one's touching this. No one's buying the Genesis marketplace. The only way I could possibly see someone buying this again is if they were going to do a merger, like a legitimate business and try to acquire uh, Genesis market. But why do it? The second Genesis goes under all of the customers for Genesis Marketplace, they're going to they're gonna flee to another um, dark web marketplace, period, end of story. It's just like uh, social media, right? Like when Twitter turned into a dumpster fire, everybody just like went to Mastodon, right? And now Threads is out and everybody's going over there. You, you don't need to buy Twitter. Sorry, Elon. You don't need to buy Twitter. You don't need to buy Mastodon. Like, you can't even control where people are going to go. That's customer sentiment. And people in marketing get paid lots of money to understand customer sentiment. Long story short, FBI is doing their job. Regulators! Mount up. And I tip my hat to you, uh, FBI. Thank you. I love it when the FBI breaks these uh, cyber criminal syndicates down. It's awesome. Unless it's Interpol. And only because Interpol has a slightly better name. And I'll give them the edge. U.S. and E.U. agree on a new data transfer agreement. The European Union announced it adopted a new transatlantic data adequacy agreement with the United States. E.U. Justice Commissioner Dieter Raidners said the agreement will allow for personal data flows between the two on the basis of a stable and trusted arrangement that protects individuals and provides legal certainty to companies. Ugh. The prior two data sharing agreements had been struck down in court over concerns that European data could fall under U.S. surveillance powers. Since U.S. surveillance laws remain intact, the issue remains a major point of contention. Austrian activist Max Schrems filed successful lawsuits against the previous two data transfer frameworks. He remains critical of the new agreement, saying he expects the issue to be back before the Court of Justice for the European Union by the start of 2024. All right, just as a production note, I just took a slug of my coffee and it was like tons of grit. And I know... If, I know if there's any Marines in the uh, chat, they're like, oh, that's the good stuff. But Jesus, guys, I don't run a French press so I can eat silt, okay? That was disgusting. Whatever I just drank was gross. French presses, the, the entire function of it is literally the only, the only service the French press is providing is that screen that separates the silt from my, from my coffee, from my, my you know, black gold that I want to drink. And oh, oh God, that was disgusting. Uh, I don't know if I can recover from that. Holy mackerel. Oh, uh, I wish I had a tongue scraper right now. 
Okay, I'm gonna do my best to battle on. Okay. We we will rebuild. We will rebuild. Okay, so check it out. This is a data related one. So this is a story that's much more associated with. Um, oh my God, I am struggling to come back from this one. Um, normally when we talk as information security practitioners, we're talking more like reactive, like, oh, this threat actor did this or API key resets. It's like, it's very tactical. It's very transactional. It's very in the weeds. Well, occasionally we do have bigger picture strategic geopolitical things. And this is one of those. This is all around data sharing, which I know is like a snooze topic to most people, but when we think about the data, God, oh my God, I've said this for years. Go back, 2015, InfoSec ICU, the first part podcast I ever did. I said this, I said this then and I say it now and people make fun of me or have, um, you know, playfully, you know, facetiously elbowed me in the ribs about this. Data is the new gold, okay? Go back and look at, and for those international people, I'm sorry if this reference falls flat, but like, if you go back and look at the turn of the century, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, JP Morgan, these were the Gilded Age families that were the wealthiest of the wealthy. Why? Because they controlled steel, railroads, and financial systems. Guess what? Who is the richest people today? Bezos, Zuckerberg, Elon Musk. What do they own? Tech. They own tech. You can call Tesla a car company. It's a software company. Let's be real. They own tech. And what does tech, big tech own? Data. All the data. Data is the new freaking gold. We live in the digital gilded age. Like, take the blinders off. That's what's going on here. Okay? So when we talk about data transfer like this, the European Union over the last couple of years has done everything it can to put GDPR in place, have these great data privacy rules, and the big tech giants, like, they're almost like... Um, they're almost like, you know what, this is so ridiculous, but think about like, um, you know, Jumpman um, or, or um, like the huge Voltron guys or when um, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers would all join together and be this huge thing and they'd take on like a super monster, a kaiju, right? Did you guys see Pacific Rim? Hold on. I know, like, stay with me. <laughs> I will, res I will um, relate Pacific Rim to... Um, EU, United States data transfer policies, okay? Look at this. Okay, believe me. Oh my God, this is gonna get all pixelated. All right, I don't know if you guys remember Pacific Rim, but like the, these like were piloted by humans. Uh, they were monsters that they were just as big. They were fighting. They were the size of si like uh, skyscrapers. Okay, Jerry, what are you saying? Okay, imagine, if you will, for a second, that this guy on the left is Amazon, this guy in the middle is Meta, and this guy on the right is whatever data broker, okay? And the European Union, it, like, and they're attacking cities and stuff, and the European Union puts GDPR in place, and they're, like, banging across, like, a force field. Like, they can't get in. They're like, ah, oh, we want in. Well, guess what? Guess who's funding, and I hate, this isn't a political show, who is funding lobbyists who is funding political campaigns you need a war chest to run for any type of office in the united states senator okay who's funding that oh well, i would have to imagine big tech companies right so when you pay favors like that you get things like this this data transfer is good news for pacific uh, for for the zuckerbergs for the data brokers right for the people who are buying and selling data enriching data data is the new gold this data transfer is going to open up opportunities, new lines of, of revenue, basically, for uh, these big tech companies. That's all this is. This right here is a, um, a, 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 it's, it's, it's a, it's a hole in the side of the GDPR hull boat, right? And everybody's getting fat on it. Great cash, homie. And, th and that's all there is to it, right? I mean, the reason that the EU, the, the reason it says it's li likely to face legal attack from the EU, you want to guess why? Because, man, they're probing the, the they're probing the shield. They they're, they're putting some legislation in that that allows them to kind of jam their hand in through the shield and reach in and pull some stuff out. And guess what? Once you uh, hold on, where is it? Once you put your hand in, hold on. Once you put your hand in, whoop. 
Then you can put another hand in. Whoop, then you can open that hole, and then you can climb in. Right? You feel me? All right. I know, dude, here's the thing. I know it's super starchy, and it's geopolitical, slow-moving, molasses, but, but this is big. This is a big story. This is, like, guys, look at how much fines Meta and Amazon have paid in the last year alone in GDPR fines. If you don't believe me, Google Ireland Meta fine. Google Amazon France fine. We're talking close to a billion dollars. I don't know about you, but I don't have a million dollars, let alone a thousand million dollars. Okay? Damn. All right, let's keep going. Code Interpreter plugin comes to ChatGPT. OpenAI developed the plugin for its own internal use, and now it's making it available to all ChatGPT Plus subscribers. Essentially, this opens the door for the large language model chatbot to write and run code in Python, as well as the files you approve of with a limit of up to 100 megabytes. This allows ChatGPT to do things like generate charts, maps, data visualizations, graphics, and create interactive HTML pages, and more. It appears to be especially useful for data scientists dealing with complex data sets. The idea is that Code Interpreter would be great at democratizing and simplifying these types of tasks, usually done by data scientists. Oh, 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 oh man. Yeah, good for democratizing. How about replacing? Holy Jesus. Okay, um, I've got bad news for you. Uh, if you're a data scientist dabbling in cyber. Um, okay, so first of all, cat GPT. Shall we play a game? This is not surprising, but it's also not good. Again, I apologize for the uh, the clipping on the on the screen here. Um, okay, so here's the deal. If you were an artist or a creative, you were probably nervous about ChatGPT and uh, really more like Mid Journey. If you were a marketing or copy person or a blog poster or an editor, you were probably concerned about ChatGPT. But data scientists, they're like, oh, no, 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 we're fine. We're good. We're good, right? They're coming for your jobs too, my man or my lady. Uh, this isn't good. I've seen data. So here's the deal. Data science is wicked fun. It's wicked cool. Uh, if you know, like, Tableau, uh, Power BI, like, you take a bunch of data that doesn't seem to have any kind of relation or anything, and you dump it in these tools, and then a data scientist can use their knowledge to massage the data, enrich the data, make the data interesting so you can defer insights from the data. Now, I just put the chat GPT story aside for a second. I just want to remind everybody, data scientists, they may have existed, but they were not mainstream 15 years ago, okay? Do you know why they're a mainstream job right now? Do you know why Many companies have data science officers and data science departments. Oh, what was that story I was just talking about, about the big tech, the richest people in the world, and, you know, data is the new gold? What was I saying? What was it? Why would we want to hire someone to enrich the data and pull insights from the data to be able to do things that will make us money? Great cash, homie from the data. This this is like part and parcel. The reason data science is an entire field of study is because there's so much, much freaking data making so much freaking money that they will pay people to do that. Now, having said all that, um, really good data scientists will start making not just insights, but interesting infographics, right? Things that you can look at and discern uh, insights from to be able to make decisions. Ultimately, that's what you want data to do. You want data to inform your decisions. Guys, I talk about quantified risk assessments with Panopsi all the time, right? The reason I do is because they go in and they pull all your data, your people, your process, your technology, your threat landscape, your industry, your business size. They put it into like the Yahtzee tumbler and shake it and then out dumps a quantified risk assessment. That is why it's quantified. Guys, if you know what the term quantified and qualified, those are the two things. Qualified means subjective. Quantified means objective. It's based on numbers. It's based on science. It's based on fact. That's what quantified is. You need data to make it quantified. That's what data scientists do. Okay, so that's why it's a job. If I didn't do cyber, I would dabble in data science because I think it's fascinating. Now, going back to the story. 
ChatGPT has a plugin that basically replaces your data science office. If I was a data science person right now, I would bury myself in this ChatGPT data analyst plugin. I would learn the crap out of it. And then I would market myself as, hey, boss, yes, this thing can do pretty much the job of our whole department, but guess what? I know how to use it the most effectively, right? And I'm, I'm sorry, it, it's gonna turn into like survival of the fittest or like last person on the island. I'm just saying, if you're watching this right now and you are a um, data science person, you may wanna like pause the stream and like get get intimate. I mean, pants off, like get, get like light some candles, bring in ChatGPT data science plugin and, and lock yourself in the room for the weekend and, and, and you know, get to know each other because this is going to be incredibly valuable uh, as a tool for you to um, move way faster and produce better results and identify and distinguish yourself as the go-to person. Okay, way to go ChatGPT. Also, as a quick side fact, I have been using ChatGPT plugins. They are wicked powerful. Holla. Okay, let's keep going. And now a word from our sponsor, Opal. Opal is the data-centric identity platform. Identity is one of the last great enterprise frontiers. It's fragmented with legacy architecture. Opal's mission is to empower enterprises to understand and calibrate access end to end. The best security teams from companies like Databricks, Figma, Blend, and Drata use Opal to build identity security for scale. That's O-P-A-L dot dev. Ransomware. All right, it is the mid-roll, so let me holler at you for a minute. If you're new here, first-timers, I think Jordan, is it Jordan Ritter from Italy? This is what we do every day. All right, guys, I want to thank all of you for being here. Nice. Eric Q using uh, ChatGPT. Eric Q, I'm not trying to scare you either. I'm just uh, I'm offering my suggestion on how I would uh, stay ahead of the curve on this one. Okay, guys, so every uh, single day we have a mid-roll, and at this time I want to thank all of you, 267 of you wonderful people here live with me in chat. Uh, genuinely appreciate it. You make the show. If you guys weren't here, I wouldn't come down here and turn the camera on. So thank you so very much for being here. If you want to pay it forward, if you want to help the next Jordan Ritter find the stream, hit the like button right now. I know it sounds cliche, hit the like button, the bell for notifications. Guys, by hitting the like button, you're telling the YouTube algorithm that cyber people like this show and it will go find other people searching for cyber content. That's how we grow the community. So please hit the like button. I want to thank the stream sponsors, Panopsi and Anti-Siphon Training for their continued support. But let's holler at Barricade Cyber for just a hot minute, if we will. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can have massive issues for businesses and send dedicated hardworking business owners into turmoil. But guess what, y'all? Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Believe that. All the sponsors, including Barricade, have their links in the description below. Please uh, help the channel out. Go check out the sponsors. That's you know, they want us, they believe in the show and what we're doing here, but also, you know, they, they have a call to action down in the description below. So please go check it out um, at some point. Uh, it would genuinely appreciate it. Also, just a reminder, I don't, I don't allow sponsorships with products I don't believe in. So uh, definitely worth doing. Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Let's go, Nick. Uh, Jenny Housley, I'll ask you. Um, I don't think Let's Go Nick is in chat right now. I don't know if Let's Go Nick posted on uh, LinkedIn. So Let's Go Nick may have uh, not gone Nick. Not gone Nick, uh, didn't post, but that's okay. Um, we will hand the baton over for Let's Go Nick and keep the train rolling. Uh, I, Jenny or Chad or Maud, I feel like yesterday there was somebody who wanted to do it um, and we just missed them. So let me know uh, who we should tag in chat, please. So the Simply Cyber Community Challenge, guys, what is it? Every single day, somebody takes the baton and is the official um, Simply Cyber Community Challenge holder. They will go, oh, let's go, Nick is here. Yes, let's go, Nick. 
So, Nick, do me two things. One, tag somebody so we can pass the baton. And two, drop a link in chat uh, on your LinkedIn post. Guys, whoever gets the baton, go on LinkedIn. Go on LinkedIn. Find the hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. You can search for it. Music's too loud. Okay, Nico. Um, I can't really do anything about the music right now, Nico. Thank you. Oh, my God. So much. Uh, Did we just become best friends? Yep. Listen, the Simply Cyber Community Challenge is one of the best ways to build your network on LinkedIn. Volunteer. Thank you so much, James Wilquick. And let's go, Nick, with the super chat also. Thanks. Let's go, Nick. Um, guys, just basically go on and search for hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge and, con and comment on the post and connect with everybody. That's the most important part. Connect with everybody who posted and is in the comments, including yourself. And you will build your um, Eric Q. All right. So Eric Q, data analyst Eric Q with the win. All right. Let's go Eric Q. All right, guys. Every single Tuesday, I do a little special segment called Tidbits Tuesday where I share a little something special about me that you may not know. If you were uh, on jawjacking yesterday, I teased out that I was going to be starting a second channel. Um, so here's the Tidbits Tuesday. I dabbled a little bit. I'm going to be starting a second channel. Simply Cyber, the main one that we are all familiar and you know love, um, we'll, we'll continue to be Simply Cyber, and all the professional stuff will be on Simply Cyber. So produce content, the Daily Cyber Threat Brief, etc. But I'm dabbling with... Um, the other channel is going to be called the Simply Cyber Cafe. This is just a rough um, artist rendering from an artist who is not artistic, me. Um, but it's going to be the Simply Cyber Cafe, and it's going to be for more informal stuff. All the jaw jacking will be on the SC Cafe. All AMAs will be on that. Um, the the Simply CyberCon um, transparency meetings, gameplays. Like I haven't figured out all the content, but this is what's going to be on. This is this is what's coming probably in September. So um, giddy up on that. I hope you like it. Um, and we'll go from there. So that's a little tidbits Tuesday behind me. All right, let's keep the the ball rolling on this guy. Our group claims large breach at UK NHS. The Alf V ransomware organization added BART's Health NHS Trust to its leak site. BART's, the largest NHS trust, which serves over 2.5 million patients, confirmed it's investigating the incident. Exfiltrated data seen by TechCrunch claims to show employee documents like passports, as well as confidential internal emails. This marks the second major data breach involving NHS data. In June, an attack on the University of Manchester saw an NHS database with data on over 1 million patients accessed. Yeah, okay. So I, I talked about this yesterday. I wasn't sure with Alfie Black Cat whether or not they hit healthcare. Thanks, Alfie Black Cat, for confirming it. They are hitting healthcare. Um, okay, guys, uh, this is just it, this is just a ransomware story, um, which is sad that that's the current state of affairs where we say it's just a. Um, Oh, yeah, and, and uh, Simply Cyber Cafe is going to have Discord chat, not simply uh, YouTube chat. Okay, so here's the deal. Alfie, a.k.a. Black Cat, a.k.a. Dark Side, which was their original name when they hit Colonial Pipeline years ago, they are a Tier 1 threat actor. They're a Tier 1 ransomware group. They're very sophisticated. I believe they're doing ransomware as a service. I think I ask this every single time they're in the news, and Eric Taylor always confirms or denies that. Um, but anyways... They hit the national health system in the UK. Um, I'm not really well versed on UK policy and infrastructure, but it's basically like their health system. Famously, WannaCry knocked NHS offline back in the day, if you want to look into that. Uh, two and a half million patient records compromised. Remember, we're talking GDPR. So this is going to hurt the NHS. Um, you know, we'll see if they pay the ransom. I'm not, con I'm not sure... So here's one thing that I'm confused on. So usually ransomware is they encrypt your files so your computer doesn't work and they exfil your files so they can sell you the key or they can sell your files to someone else or back to you. Double extortion, classic, classic double extortion, okay? With the Move It vulnerability recently in the Clop ransomware gang, 
They were just exfilling data. Klopp ransomware was not encrypting data as far as I know. They were only exfilling data. So there's this huge saturation in the market and in the news of just exfil, not ransom, uh, not encryption. So with this UK, um, with this UK hack and ransomware attack, I'm not sure if it if if it see how it says exfiltration of data. I'm not sure if NHS actually got encrypted also. Uh, let me see, encrypted. Yeah, the word encrypt isn't even in the news story. So not, not to, here's the thing. It doesn't lessen the story that NHS's systems were not encrypted, but all their data, patients data was stolen. That's still bad, but there is a really specific um, distinction here. The distinction is if you just exfil data, the healthcare system is not impacted from a patient delivery capability, right? Like their business operations are not down. All they did was have their data copied off. They can still take patients. They can still treat, treat strokes. They can still bill. Like their business continues to operate. Great cash, homie. Which is far less impactful than just stealing patient data, okay? And I'm not minimizing people's health data getting stolen. What I'm saying is... That is something for the lawyers to take care of, while me, the physician, will continue to treat the patients, and you, the billing office, will continue to charge insurance to pay for that. So the, the money printing machine that is the healthcare system will continue to print money, and this, this issue right here, where is it? Let me, this issue right here, that's for the lawyers to sort out, okay? And I almost wonder if Alfie Black Hat has has gotten wise to the fact that like like I said, their businesses, right? Their businesses. So I almost wonder, like I'm like this is a tinfoil hat Jerry thing if the squad wants to drop the emotes for this one. Tinfoil hat. I almost wonder if the amount of money they were making from ransom encryption key selling wasn't that business wasn't as good as just data exfil because here's the thing if i encrypt your files and you're not going to pay the encryption uh you're not going to pay for the decryption key well then that's wasted energy on my part if i encrypt your files and your business goes out of business because when i encrypt your files your business stops working and you're no longer able to Great cash, homie. produce money you can't pay me if you're not producing money but if I just steal all your data and you're still able to see patients, make widgets, you know, handle transactions, whatever it is, well, then you're making money that you can pay me. You feel me? So I almost wonder if that's the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the modus operandi of these tier one threat actors. It's an interesting evolution if that's the case, but I personally am going to keep an eye on it. And I'd be curious if... Um, Eric Taylor or any other uh, SecOps people in chat have seen a uh, um, a trend going towards exfil only and how businesses are reacting, especially Eric Taylor, who deals with incident response all the time. Eric Taylor from Barricade Cyber. If you're dealing with incidents all the time and all there is is a data exfil, no encryption, is the business like, oh, just pay the pay it and let's go, pay it and let's go? I wonder. Um. Yeah, so Shuttle Crab asks, would this even be classified as ransomware? Because they're holding it for ransom, but the business has access to their systems and data. Yeah, I mean, so yes, I would consider it ransomware because the with traditional ransomware, they're holding your systems ransom and they'll give you your systems back. On this one, they're just holding your data ransom. It, it, it is a nuance, but me personally, I would argue it's still ransomware because they're holding something from you that you want back and have to pay, right? Like if I have, like this is horrible, but unfortunately it's the first thing that jumps in my mind, right? Like if someone were to steal my child and hold them ransom, my family can still operate. I still have another child and I'm, I'm not, I'm not minimi I didn't have two to have like a contingency plan for children. But like, my point is like the family can continue to operate, but we still want that child back. Right. So it's not exactly one to one uh, story, but you get what I'm saying. Like we, it, it's, it's something of yours that they are holding and they will only give it back 
if you pay a fee, right? Like if um, what's a what's a less creepy example I can provide? Um, like if someone stole your bicycle seat, right? You could still ride the bike. You wouldn't want to sit down, <laughs> but you could. And you you could sit down. You wouldn't want to. You could ride the bike, but it would be a pain in the butt. Or you could pay the ransom and get your bike seat back. Okay. Let's go with that example. Uh, editors, please scrub my child kidnapping <laughs> story. Bullet flaw exploited for $20 million. The Financial Times' sources say threat actors exploited a flaw in the payment system for the fintech startup Revolut. This resulted in stealing over $20 million over the course of several months. The attack started from a disconnect between the company's European and U.S. payment systems, which would erroneously refund accounts when it declined specific transactions. The first incident seemed to have cropped up a few times in 2021 before becoming fully weaponized in 2022. This reportedly impacted Revolut's corporate funds rather than those from customers. Sorry, I, I was reading chat to see if I was being um, classified as a monster. And for those who are Midnight fans, like, I was I was worried I was going to be classified as a monster. Monster, right? Oh, my God. Um, yes, actually, hilarious, Olu. Oh, <laughs> it would be a real pain in the butt to have someone steal your bicycle seat. Uh, I'm sorry. So I wasn't I didn't hear or read this story. Let me just read the uh, the dive brief. If if you would grant me this grace for a moment. Talk amongst yourselves. Water chestnuts. Water. <laughs> Not water. Nor chests. Nor nuts. Discuss. All right. Payment flaw allowed criminals to steal 20 million from a bank uh, over several months. By the way, great controls in place. Bank. You got robbed for multiple months and you didn't catch that? Nice job. I'm sure it doesn't help to kick them while they're down, but it seems kind of silly. Um, uh, Neobank would use its own money to refund certain decline payments. Okay. So that's trying to cover the... Uh, that's that's like inverted fraud. Like they're trying to... Um, yeah, okay. The loophole was closed in 2022 after U.S. Bank Partner Bank notified the company that was holding less than it anticipated. So this just sounds like... Um... Wow. So I see what's happening. I wonder how the criminals figured it out. This seems like an insider thing. So here's the deal. This is the deal, okay? And by the way, this is unbelievable. Okay, here's the deal. This isn't a cyber story. This is an idiot story. What, do I have a... You are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. Okay, so this neobank re revolt. Or, yeah, revolt. It's revolting. Ah, It's more like revolute, but it's revolting to me. What they would do is, if I made a, a purchase and it was like over my limit or whatever... They had such poor controls in place that they couldn't really tell how much money the account had or didn't have or whatever. So what they ended up doing was they would just fund the purchase for declined payments. So obviously, somebody discovered, maybe on the inside and told somebody on the outside or whatever, hey, if you make a purchase you can't afford, like buy a Rolex, buy a Lamborghini, buy whatever, and it's declined, don't sweat it. Revolt will... Um, cover it because they're trying to look like they're solvent. They're trying to look like they're above water and above board. They're trying to look like a good bank. By the way, by the way, term neo bank. Get out of here with that. Are you stupid, neo bank? It reminds me of that. Um, what was that freaking um, Ponzi scam bank? Um, Luna was it Luna? Luna Bank or whatever it was. Is it? Oh my God! Is it? Is it Luna Bank and Terra? Was it Luna Bank and Terra that had that guy? They were like, "Oh, like you can't trust banks. Trust us. We're not a bank," which means that we're not liable to follow banking regulations. I think it was Terra and Luna, uh, run by this guy. Anyways, long story short, this is ridiculous. Um. This, by the way, this is a direct result of poor, poor 
um, internal controls and somebody at the top making a boneheaded decision to cover decline payments for some reason. No, not FTX. It happened at the same time as FTX. Um, uh, what is it? I, I don't want to go too far down jawjacking. Um, oh, my God. It's pronounced Revolut. No, James McQuiggan, I know it's Revolut. I know it's Revolut. But I'm saying that they're revolting. That's my point. I was I was being intentionally um, disrespectful to them. Banks are not your friend. T-shirt, Terra Bank. Maybe it's not Terra. Oh my God. I'll I'll, I'll do it during the jawjacking. Sorry, guys. Spyware sends data to China. Researchers from the security firm Pradio discovered a pair of malicious apps in the Google Play Store. Both posed as file utilities with a combined 1.5 million installs. No, it's not by These apps launched without user interaction after installing, with researchers observing them sending data unprompted to several servers in China. Data sent included contact info, media, location, as well as network and device information. The researchers noted that despite the high number of installs, neither app showed reviews on the Play Store, indicating use of emulators to boost numbers. The researchers contacted Google to take down the apps before publishing findings. All right. Somebody said it in chat. Um, Celsius, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Wednesday. We'll look at it at jawjacking. It was definitely Celsius. And three, uh, um, it could have been Three Arrows Capital. It was definitely Celsius. That was the coin. It was a very similar scam to what um, FTX did. Okay, so two spyware setting data. It's a very data heavy day over here at Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. Two heavy, uh, uh, two spyware sending data of a million and a half users. Guys, I will tell you this. I've said this on the stream before, but it's worth pointing out. China, like North Korea, is all about stealing your money. China is all about espionage. Now, people will argue, speculate, right? Tinfoil hat. Um, it's TikTok stealing your data very overtly, or they have these malicious softwares in the Google Play Store stealing your data. Pretty much the same way um, people are arguing that TikTok's doing it. Just TikTok's a little bit more weaponized because they're also, some people are speculating that you, people in the US are getting entertainment videos on TikTok. People in China are getting educational videos. So it's like a long play to uh, curb the knowledge base, generationally speaking, uh, for the next generation. Anyways. Um, a million and a half users sending data. I, I almost want to say this is a routine story. We see malware in the Google Play Store all the time. Usually it's like either info stealers uh, for passwords and stuff. Sometimes it's like click jacking in order to get um, revenue, right? Like, you know, basically uh, it's almost like a botnet for, for clicking on ads um, or links and stuff like that. If you if you think about the way that that hyperlink in the newsletter, uh, if you click on that, it helps support the channel. Like imagine doing that at scale with a million and a half users and, and forcing their phone to click on it. This one, they're just stealing data. I don't know what kind of data they've been stealing, but China is definitely um, the 500 pound gorilla in the room when it comes to espionage and data stealing. Um, let's see. Two apps have a large number of users, but no reviews. Okay, so probably bots uh, downloading them. Yeah, see, install our farm mobile device emulators to fake those numbers to increase the rank. So this is a way... So by the way, this is uh, like... If you look... At, like, you you can do this in Simply... Like, in YouTube too, right? Like, right now, the YouTube channel has like 68,000 subscribers. And those are real humans, right? But if you wanted to be a... A, a, a donkey you could have a million fake accounts sign up right so this is it, it's called farming and there's ways to do it if you if you there's ways to do it but basically what china's doing in this instance is they're farming fake installs it's kind of i mean it's almost <laughs> i'd almost argue it it's like a little lazy um because there were zero reviews you'd think that they would at least put a couple reviews in there to kind of look at, make it look a little real but it's it's stealing uh, potentially pictures, audio, video, user location, 
some information on the phone itself and the network provider it's using, okay? Who knows what they're doing with this information? Um, basically, wholesale doing it and then hoping Eric Q and the other data analysts can take that data and deliver and derive some insights from it. Uh, long term, probably, um, to see if they can get any VIPs, phones, and stuff like that. But let's be real. Executives, they got to have their iPhone. So Enhanced Edge Copilot will have a long memory. Microsoft announced an enhanced Copilot experience for its Bing-powered sidebar in the Edge browser. This gives Edge users... Hold on. Nicole's got a good question. What are the apps? I'll go back and see if they, if they share them. ...access to Microsoft's new chatbot, which is able to create output based on text queries. Pretty typical generative AI stuff at this point. However, this new enhanced experience will add in a memory feature, allowing users to pick up prior interactions with the chatbot. This comes as many organizations ban the use of generative AI tools over fears of data leaks. One of the big reasons is that ChatGPT, the most popular of these types of chatbots, keeps all conversations by default. This means any leak of ChatGPT credentials risks exposing company information. Adding in this memory feature to a default Windows browser seems to further exacerbate privacy and security considerations with these tools. All right, a couple things, uh, and then I'll look to see if those apps are referenced. No problem, Nicole. All right, so Microsoft Edge, Bing AI, Cyber. Okay, so if you're using Microsoft Edge and you use Bing AI, uh, it, it basically just has memory now, okay? Uh, I use ChatGPT and I use Bard. Uh, both of them allow you to uh, pick up where you left off. Here's the thing. Even though AI is wicked smart, I'm a human and I'm like, okay, smart. So I might have an idea like, oh, I'd love to, you know, give me some information on this, right? Whatever. And then later on, I want to, I, I thought of something else. I went for a run and I thought of something else to refine it. I want to pick it back up, especially because sometimes when you, um, like when you are talking to these AI things, there's prompting, which is like asking it something, but there's also priming, right? And sometimes the priming is like really extensive and exhaustive, right? I remember uh, Clint Bow Dungeon over on Threat Gen, Red versus Blue. He input all the rules to Threat Gen Red versus Blue game into the chat GPT. So then he could ask a question about the game and it would know what it was saying. If you had to input all those rules every time you used it, it would be an incredible inconvenience. So now you can save that primed AI instance pretty easily. Microsoft Edge, basically, they're announcing with great fanfare that they're doing something else that the other generative AIs are already doing. Woo! Like, all right, like like one, we, we're going to launch, like, you know those, like, little plastic... Um, you know, colored cans are usually like yellow, red, or blue, and you like pull it out and it pops a little. Uh, you see them on like New Year's Eve. It's like that's that's what we're doing for this one. Toot! Like good good job, Microsoft Edge Bing AI. Like <laughs> you're doing what the other ones are doing. Like like here's a here's a lollipop. All right, so these two apps. Um, just to go back to Nicole Hewlett's question. Um, uh, two apps, two apps, two apps, two apps. Uh, the two apps are uh, File Recovery and Data Recovery and File Manager. Uh, these are the two. And here you go. Um, Nicole and everybody in chat, check out these two apps. Ca uh, malware. Okay. You can't even download them anyways because they're not in the store. But these are the two apps. So if you have them for some... Un yeah, Confetti Poppers. Thanks, William Welch. Woo! <laughs> it's it's like it's like announcing that your company is now offering customer support. It's like, yeah, no kidding. Like, thanks. <laughs> we okay. All right. Oh, I think that's it for the stories. Week we have a special CISO. All right. So That's going to do it for the stories. But before you go, if you're here just for the news, I want to remind everybody that tomorrow at 1, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time, Subro Sengupta GRC podcast with John and Craig was awesome. Thank you, Subro, for the super chat. And uh, if you don't know what Subro is talking about, I'll show you in a second during jaw jacking. Okay, really quick. Uh, tomorrow... Uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern time, we're continuing the How to Market Your Cyber Self 
um, limited run podcast series. Episode four is tomorrow, 1 p.m. We're talking with Virginia Case, marketing executive, and um, really, really insightful, smart professional around leveling up your thought leadership from zero to cyber hero. If you've watched any of the first three episodes, you know dang well that you basically just welcome Virginia to the show and then get out of her way because she's deli- she's driving the value train and it's a runaway train. It's a locomotive on fire uh, with the amount of value she's dropping on us, okay? All right, so definitely check that out. Uh, obviously, thank you all so very much for being here. If you were here just for the news, uh, I bid you good day. If this was in September and we were gonna go to the new channel, I would end the stream and it would automatically push you to the Simply Cyber Cafe. But until we get there, let's flip it over to the jaw jacking segment. All right, hold on. Maybe I could do this like. um... Okay, now we're in the jaw jacking segment. Welcome everybody uh, to jaw jacking. I'll have, um, I'll here. Welcome to the Simply Cyber Cafe. This is, I'm your host, Gerald Lozier, and we are going to start some jaw jacking, which is water cooler talk for cyber pros. Um, let's see, a couple things to talk about. Uh, if you saw Subro's, uh, Sengupta's, um, Jess Bishop wants a Panopsi emoji. Yeah, we could do that. Um, let me, hold on. I have to check to see if, um, hold on. It, I, Jess, I'll, I'll check, okay? Um, like basically you need certain amount of squad members to unlock stuff. Uh, so we'll do that. If you're wondering what Subro was talking about, let me show you guys on, I did not tell chat. I did not tell the community that I was doing this. I just did it. This right here, GR here, I'm going to drop a link in chat. This right here, uh, last Friday, I did a, a Renegade podcast. I was on the Hacker Versus podcast. Uh, and for one hour, all we did was talk about how to implement GRC and all the tricks of the trade and all of the mistakes that people make and all of the things that you will not learn in a textbook. And uh, I was actually asked if I would put this podcast into the GRC course. And I'm not going to because I'm going to do something else. But if you're interested in learning uh like real grc deep dive i went bananas i look like a lunatic um freaking out about all these things in grc so that's what's up with that um audio manager was not included in that leak uh i don't know what you're talking about shannon but i don't think so um can we welcome let me welcome nicole hewlett nicole hewlett came by the uh haiku let's play yesterday uh, so Simply CyberCon, P- Paris Gatsby asks, will Simply CyberCon be talked about in the cafe channel or here? It will be talked about in both Paris. Uh, so I'll provide updates and stuff on Simply CyberCon on the Simply Cyber channel. But for the transparency meetings and the like, the more um, casual, basically think about the cafe. Think about it this way. Simply Cyber is like the professional one and Simply Cyber Cafe is like the casual weekends out of office after hours um one right that, that's kind of how i'm doing it like professional and i don't want to say unprofessional but professional and casual is kind of the, the two vibes all right someone said we need a cafe shirt and i agree it's smooth simple design a must on a shirt yeah thank you uh, i'm gonna do it this is just kind of like a mock-up what i want to do i really like what kimberly did with the simply cyber con Uh, If you saw this, let me make, hold on. Let me make sure I don't have a meeting. Classic Jerry. Okay. I don't. Okay. So you see this simply right here. I want that except Kimberly. I don't even know if you have access to this font. I would love the SC and then uh, maybe cafe in yellow or cafe. Like I, I, this is a concept. I want it to look like this, but I want it to be cooler. I don't know how to do it cooler because I'm not an artist, um, but I definitely want retro synth wave. I want that sun. You know, the Simply Cyber logo um, is like this black, you know, you know, black polish looking. Oh, you can't really see it on stream, but 
whatever. You, you guys know what the logo looks like. So, anyways. Let's see what else. Yeah, Kimberly's done amazing work. What's up, Jax? It's good to see you. All right. Yeah, Space Tacos. We're working. So those... Uh, thank you, Kimberly. For those who are interested in the Simply CyberCon t-shirt, I know you've seen me wear it on stream. Uh, Kimberly is leading the charge on the Simply CyberCon t-shirt. And um, it's just, we're working with a couple different vendors. The, the shirt I have, it's a great shirt, but uh, the colors are bleeding through a little bit. And we just want to make sure if you guys are going to spend money on the shirt, that you get a shirt you like. You know what I mean? All right, reading chat here. My favorite arcade game is Galaga. Oh, nice, I love that. Sorry, I didn't think it would work, just, oh wait. It's in the bottom middle, it's in the bottom middle of your overlay. What? What's catch, oh, <laughs> catch EPT, yes. It's, it's right there. It's also on my shirt, catch EPT. <laughs> Dude, I'm up here just like a live wire, man. I'll tell you what, you're getting, you're getting me raw. I, I definitely am not polished. Um, oh, Kimberly, don't apologize. You're not the printers. Have a good one, Alana. Good to see you. Jenny Housley. Guys, hey, let me just take a hot minute and thank all the mods. Guys, I, I know that I'm the one on camera, but there's an entire team behind me supporting the channel and really um, delivering it in the way that it's being delivered. Uh, Kimberly, Jenny Housley, Justin Gold, Eric Taylor, Joel Belton, Aaron KG, Stefan Walvogel. Um, just thank you. Thank you, mods, so very much. You guys, uh, Base Case, can't forget Base, the audio engineer himself. Um, just really genuinely appreciate the mod support. BSEC, uh, BSEC's been really busy lately, but that doesn't mean his contributions aren't appreciated. So thank you to the, thank you to the mod team. All right. Yeah, I think we used um, we we've used uh, the same printer. It's just it's because the uh, Simply Cybercon has like it has this it's this ticket basically and all these rich colors in the blend of these colors. That's what's bleeding through. So. Gotta bounce. Have a good one, Travis. All right. All right, so if you stayed this long, right? We're about five, six minutes over from the news. So if you stayed this long, you're a jaw jacking and simply cyber community regular. Holla, holla, holla. Got a special surprise for you. Eric Taylor, our own Eric Taylor, will be mo uh, hosting the show tomorrow morning. Uh, thank you, Eric Taylor. I'm actually going out um, later uh, this evening to uh, a good college friend, a very, very close college friend. I'm very fortunate. Uh, I have my wife, obviously, who's my best friend, but I have three college friends that I, I hold near and dear to my heart, like so close that they're the kind of friend. I don't know if you have a friend like this or friends like this, but like literally if my phone rang right now and they said they needed me, I would, I would end this stream abruptly I would tell my wife what happened and then I would drive to the airport and just say, I need the first flight. I don't care the price. Give me the first flight. I don't care the airline. Put me in a, in a FedEx plane. I don't care. Get me to where I need to go. Like that's the level of friend I have uh, with these three dudes. And one of them uh, I don't get to see very often because I live like 800 miles away from him. But we're going. I'm going to spend, uh, have dinner with him and do some stuff. So tomorrow uh, Eric will be covering for me on the stream. So. Thank you very much, Eric. The real Bilbo with Team Live. What's up, Bilbo? <clears throat> All right. Um, we've got the Simply Cyber Con uh, agenda all built out, so that's really cool. Celery says, just started as a security analyst. What certs do you think are useful? Well, security analyst is super generic, Celery, so I'm not sure like what industry you're in or what type of work you're doing. Is it GRC analyst? Is it SOC analyst? Um, 
I would say SEC Plus is always good. Um, you know, maybe CYSA Plus. Start. I mean, you already have the job, which is usually part of the challenge. So um, get get trained up on workflows and methodology. That would be huge. Um, oh, Shuttle Crab knows what I'm talking about. All right, Kimberly and Tim McDonald are connecting. Very good. It is really special. I, I've known these guys um, more than half my life. Yeah, I've known they've been they've been my closest friends uh, for for 25 years, frankly. Yeah, maybe not get on a FedEx plane. Smart cat GPT. Oh, casually Joseph, dude, you're talking West Ashley. That's my stomping grounds, bro. Yeah, frothy beards, uh, good times. Oh, sock analyst. Okay, cool. So what I would say, Celery, is um, CYSA Plus, if you want to get a certification. Um, I know of Network Chuck. I don't know Network Chuck. Um, Celery, I would say um, CYSA Plus, if you want, uh, Let's Defend is a really good platform for learning... Um, for learning uh see this hands-on sock analyst training this is a great website uh good training here I'll, I'll drop it in here i think i think if you use simply cyber at checkout if you if you do end up liking it um you'll get 10 percent off with code simply cyber i just had a conversation with these guys on monday uh yesterday and uh i'm gonna i'm gonna like i i use their platform no it was last monday I use their platform. I like their platform. I'm going to affiliate with them. I just haven't announced it or anything like that, but that coupon code does work, Simply Cyber. Yep, Security Blue Team's another good one. Uh, Qualys is good. Yeah, if you learn Qualys, that's good, Carrie. Uh, the uh, vulnerability scanners are all pretty interchangeable. Rapid7, Nexus, Qualys. So if you learn one, uh, you'll be good with the other ones. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, Network Chuck, he's, he's massive. The, the, one of the challenges with Network Chuck is that he goes like an inch deep a mile wide. He, he, he doesn't, I mean, at least in the content I've seen um, or it, on information security stuff. He's a networking, uh, he's really smart at networking. And I've seen him do some Python stuff, uh, but I've never tried his coffee, though. I know he's a big coffee guy. Um, will sec plus help with a grc analyst position sure yeah uh, it'll give you a baseline jeffrey but also uh, entry level grc analyst position will probably have sec plus as a requirement so to get through hr you would need it oh brendan yeah eric taylor is amazing uh, love myself some eric taylor uh jenny housley the tidbit tuesday was basically that i'm gonna start another channel and call it sc cafe and it's gonna have a retro synth vibe because because <laughs> i love it all right uh where is this green bone is free yep open vase you you pay for what you get right Um, Benjamin Middleton, I do not know if David Meese still has openings, but what I could tell you is if you reach out to him, he's definitely, um, uh, he's definitely open, uh, to talking here. Let me actually, hold on. I got, I got you right here because you asked for it, Ben. There you go, Benjamin. That's the actual LinkedIn post that you can use to get to right to where, right to where he is, and um, talk to him. All right, no promise, Tom. No problem, Thomas. Hashtag Team Replay. I guess Team Hybrid for you. <sighs> yeah, network. If Network Chuck wired a Mr. Beast conference, um, yeah. I mean, he definitely knows his networking. For sure. Hey Jeffrey, when I start SC Cafe, that the rules are uh, the rules are way more relaxed. 
I can do whatever. You know what? I, like, I could even imagine doing, like, um, like movie watching. You know, it would probably violate a ton of copyright. But we could do we could do that. We could do video games. Like, like I'm excited about SC Cafe. I'm excited about SC Cafe because it's going to allow me the opportunity to be a lot more... I don't want to say flexible, but, you know... That's one of the struggles. Like, I don't do a lot of behind the scenes. I don't do, like, I love running. I love craft beer. I love, you know, retro 80s video games and cartoons and, you know, like, I love hip hop music. Like, there's tons of things about me that I don't feel aligned to the Simply Cyber channel. So I'm reluctant to integrate it because I don't want to. The, the thing with Simply, um, the thing with YouTube is, right, my YouTube channel, Simply Cyber, you go there and you know exactly what you're going to get. You watch one video. When you watch the next video, it makes sense. It's like, oh, this is what we're talking about. If you watched one video and then there was like a video of me hanging out, just chatting with chat, you'd be like, what is this? Like, this is kind of a smorgasbord of content. So I need a separate channel in order to make it make sense. All right. All right. Make sure you tell a friend if you enjoyed if you enjoyed the show. Tell a friend if you did not enjoy the show. Tell me in the mods, <laughs> and we'll get it fixed. Oh, that blow that sucks, Michael Huskin, uh, on the asthma. Oh, cool, Jenny Halsey. That's smart. Oh, Leon Element, Elliot, or we Leon Elliot. Yeah, you know what's up. Cash rules everything around me, Leon. <laughs> Love the show and the mods. Thanks, Space Tacos. I think uh, I just learned from my work that my former commander from the Army is at the Citadel. Very cool. Yeah, Shuttle Crab. The only thing I will say is when you reset a password for an end user to a crappy password, if you configure it so that they have to change their password on first login, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. If you just allow them to ha continue to have a sucky password, that's not okay. Uh, Jeffrey, don't sweat it. I'm not defacing myself for money. <laughs> I'm not going to sit on a cake uh, for money. I'm not going to, you know, I don't, I don't know what people do. Uh, I've seen these like hot tub things right i don't even know if that's still on twitch there was like there was a, a time where it was like almost like like only fans light going on over there so that's not what i'm about but uh yes i still teach at the citadel i'm actually teaching a summer course right now in fact if viper 576 is in chat viper 576 is one of my students right now uh in the fall uh i'll be teaching the on-campus uh, lecture yeah so for those who don't know um not only am i a professional i work in industry a content creator for youtube but i also am faculty at the citadel military college all right guys i gotta get out of here be good to each other thank you all so very much for all you do i'm jerry you're the simply cyber community today was july 11th tomorrow you got Eric Taylor in the a-hole chair. I'm sliding out of the a-hole chair. Be good, and until next time, stay secure. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber Community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed the